God alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times. Pour out your heart before the Lord. God is a refuge filled with steadfast love. Let us worship God. Trusting in the relentless mercy of God, let us pray our confessions. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Restore to us the joy of life lived in your presence. In the spirit of Jesus Christ, we pray. and grace, slow to anger and overflowing with mercy. The Lord binds up the broken, gives light to our minds, strengthens our wills, and gives rest to our souls. Believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning. Please be seated. Friends, welcome to Kirk in the Hills Presbyterian Church. We're delighted on this cold winter day to have the warmth of this gathered community uh, that is blessing to each and every one of us. We hope you feel a sense of welcome here. Uh, as we join together, there are uh, friendship pads found on the aisle seats of each pew. If you would hold up that, uh, that, that pad, and uh, that, that's the example. And now if you would sign it and pass it back and forth and use this as a good excuse to say hello to everyone around you and make sure that everyone knows uh, that they are welcome here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that includes our friends at Kirk West and friends online. We are delighted that you can join us from afar, uh, but in spirit be with us. So we're glad you're here also. Uh, I have a few announcements this morning uh, at 9 o'clock, uh, after the 9 o'clock worship, there will be a new member club. A new member class. If you are interested in joining with this marvelous congregation or even exploring what it might mean to join this congregation, please join uh, Pastor Edwin and, and others in the Cedar Home Chapel that uh, is, is off, to, uh, off to your left uh, as you exit this morning. We invite you to come and uh, meet people and, and discover what this marvelous church is all about. There is also a coffee hour at nine o'clock uh, for, for everyone to come and join with a sense of community as, as we seek to build friendships here uh, in, and make this a congregation where people keep growing in the, the knowledge of one another and uh, the, the love that we share here together. The Adult Formation Committee has a new offering that will take place beginning next week. Dr. Chip Hardwick, who is our Synod Executive, will be giving a class on Paul. Uh, this is uh, in preparation for uh, a journey to, uh, to, to some of the places where Paul lived that will be happening later this year. Uh, Chip is a, a marvelous teacher and a wise man, uh, and, and I think you will discover a lot of things that he has to say will be insightful for faith. This is happening at a different time it's happening after uh, this, uh, after the 11 o'clock service. Downstairs there will be a light lunch offered and you are invited to in and encouraged to come next week. At this time I'd like to invite uh, Kirk, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Keith Peters uh, to come and share with us a message about the Kirk organ. Keith, thank you. Good morning. Hey, real quick, I hope this isn't in here, but uh, yeah, the part of the organ's not working today because it's a little chilly in here. And if you didn't notice, the bell that's supposed to chime is a little stuck, I think, because of the ice. Uh, needless to say, I'm pleased to give you an update regarding the pipe organ. Last month, the first payment was made to Laterno Pipe Organ Company. Later this month, Andrew Forrest, the president of the company, will be making precise measurements inside our chambers um, for the design of the new organ. This instrument should be completed by the 80th anniversary of the Kirk. The elders and trustees with the Covenant Committee has moved $1.5 million towards the project. A generous donation has committed an additional $1 million. The total amount of the project is $3.8 million. That leaves us $1.3 million short to complete the organ as it will be designed. The vision for, of Colonel George of this beautiful church will be continued with this new instrument. It is now our turn to continue this vision in the next generation. A fundraising committee is being formed. Please contact me if you are interested. Please prayerfully consider what you may be able to do and what others may do to renew this vision. I want to close with a short part of Psalm 150, verses 3 and 4. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise the Lord. Thank you.
Okay, I'd like to invite the kids to come up. I see some lion's gear. And I know a, a certain family said they were going to wear Honolulu blue today. And another family painted their nails blue. Good to see you. Hi, Lizzie. Good morning. You have beautiful ring. Wow. Sorry, my hands are cold. Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. I brought a lunch. It's not a lunch, but there's something in here. Today, on the cover, it's, you're going to find out. You're going to find out. Today, on the cover of the bulletin, there's a picture of a man, and Eli said, is that Jesus? And I said, no, it's Jonah. And Dr. McDonald's going to teach the grown-ups about Jonah. And then I looked at Nell, and she said, I know the story of Jonah. And she said that Jonah was on a ship, and that the ship was in some scary waters, and that Jonah jumped off the ship, which was very brave, because he knew that the waters were uneasy and unsafe, because God was like, Jonah, you are not listening to me. So in the story, Jonah did not like what God wanted him to do. And he decided to do something else. Now, in Sunday school, we're not learning about Jonah, we're learning about John. John also had a call from God. And John told people about Jesus. And John listened to what God told him to do, and he went out and did it. Jonah eventually did that, but he had a consequence. Who knows what a consequence is? Yeah, me too. We all know what consequences are. Well, what if your consequence was that you had to smell fish? <laughs> yeah, you do? Okay, well, I'm going to invite you to come take a smell. Come here. What is it? It's tuna fish! So that's what happened to Jonah. His consequence is he had to smell fish. That's not our consequence if we don't listen to God's call. Yeah. Well, so this is the thing. This is the thing. God's calling us too. And if we don't listen to God's call, then we miss out. We miss out on how much he loves us. And we miss out on the plans that he has for us that help him. So even though our consequence isn't having to smell fish, it's kind of a bigger consequence. It's that you miss out on God's awesome, amazing love for you and what he has in store for you to help him tell people about Jesus. So today when you go cheer for the lions, Try to think about how awesome it is that God loves you so much. Try to take that excitement of go lions to like, go God. It's a big deal. Okay? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Parents, today you're invited to pick up your kids and go to Heritage Hall for bagels. Okay, that's where they are.
us join together in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that through these offerings that we express again our response to you, our response to your call, and our dedication to living into the fullness of life and love as you have shown us in Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing on these gifts and on the whole of our lives together as one church. Amen.
you join me in a moment of prayer? <clears throat> Gracious God, may your word speak to us in this scripture passage, and may we respond to your grace and love in your call. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Part of what I want to do always is to encourage people to read the Bible uh, and to take in all these different pieces of literature that are found there. Um, so, uh, of course, as always, I would invite you to turn to the book of Jonah uh, for this uh, scripture passage today. Uh, Jonah is in that part of the Bible that's called the Minor Prophets. Uh, if it helps, it's right after the book of Obadiah. <laughs> Now, uh, this, this passage is part of the whole, and we're going to be looking at the whole of Jonah's story today, but we will begin with chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Listen for the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the scholars disagree uh, about what kind of literature that Jonah is. They argue amongst themselves about 20 different genres of what it could be, but they all agree on two things. The two things are, number one, there is nothing else like it in all of the prophets. And number two, it's a really great story. Now, I, I was at the National Storytelling Festival a number of years ago, and I always remember some um, some storyteller and his, his, his joke just fell flat. And, and he just looked at the crowd and said, there is no cure for the humor impaired. <laughs> Which I say this morning because the book of Jonah really is an hysterical book. I, I think Presbyterian ministers make ministers learn Hebrew to help them see the nuance, and part of which is the humor of the Old Testament especially. There's multiple meanings and there's, there's all of these, uh, these, these word plays, and, and it's a lot funnier than the translators can, can get across. So sometimes Jonah is interpreted as this big example of God's wrath, but I don't think so. I'd like to argue that more than any other book in the Bible, Jonah was written by some Jewish comedian, or more accurately, a theologian with a great sense of humor, because this book is both very Jewish and very funny. But we need to not be humor impaired when we're reading it. Just because it's funny does not mean that it's not a serious piece of theological work. In the midst of the humor, there are important, profoundly important messages. If I were to retitle this, I might retitle it The Reluctant Prophet. Jonah the Reluctant Prophet. Jonah quite possibly is the worst prophet ever. If you were going to choose a modern day actor to play Jonah in a movie, you'd probably have to choose Danny DeVito. The call of God comes to him to go to Nineveh, and, and, and Nineveh is the kingdom of Assyria, and, and you remember the symbol of Assyria is that bull with wings and a king's head, which is to say that, that this is a king who with his armies can swoop in and in a flash trample their enemies. 
The Ninevites are nasty, brutish, violent, oppressive, and they've killed Israelites by the thousands, not just once, but year after year. The Assyrians are hated, and Nineveh is the mothership, the capital of them all. God calls to Jonah to go west and confront their evil ways, and the people think, oh good, we love a story of God's judgment. He's going to rain down fire like Sodom and Gomorrah, like a cosmic Jack Reacher. Jonah tells, uh, God tells Jonah, go west, and Jonah buys a ticket to head due east. A ticket to Tarshish, which we would say Gibraltar, to Spain. In those days, Tarshish was the edge of the known world. Any further east and you'd fall off the map. Jonah, the reluctant prophet, does the opposite of what God asks. Jonah gets the call from God, but Jonah has call blocking. Jonah gives God the busy signal, and then Jonah just throws away his phone. He gets on the boat humming, well, I've never been to Spain. He puts on his headphones and turns up the volume. And on the trip, a terrible storm comes up. The ancient rabbis say that there were 70 Gentile sailors on board this ship from 70 Gentile nations and one Jew. The captain calls for everyone to pray. The 70 pagan Gentiles, all devout, immediately start praying to their gods. But this one guy, this one guy, Jonah, who knows the real God, he isn't praying. He's down in his stateroom snoozing. The storm storms on. The captain wakes up Jonah to, to pray, and the storm keeps going. The sailors decide somebody has offended one of the gods, and so they toss the dice to see who it is, and the dice point right at Jonah. And he says, it's my fault. I've offended God. Toss me overboard. And all these big, hairy heathens who are supposed to be so hateful and violent, they all to a man say, no way, Jonah, that would be wrong. And they do everything they possibly can to save Jonah, which is hilarious because these people are supposed to be the bad guys, but they reveal themselves to be good guys. Jonah insists, the storm persists, so reluctantly the sailors throw him overboard and the storm instantly calms down, at which time the pagan sailors immediately convert and start praying to God, which is hysterical. Because Jonah, the world's worst prophet, isn't even trying and he has already converted a boatload of pagans. Which raises the perennial question, why do good things happen to bad prophets? Jonah's in the water. He's sinking in the sea. He decides that maybe, maybe he's made a terrible decision. When all of a sudden a great fish swallows him. Notice I say great fish. It's not a whale. I'll come back to that. Jonah is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. What do you do in the belly of a fish? It's like a bathtub in there. He does what anybody else does in the bathtub. He sings the top 10 list of his favorite psalms. And of course, like fathers everywhere, just because he does not remember all the words to the songs does not stop him from singing. The world's worst prophet just strings together lines from different psalms that he can remember. A line from Psalm 3, another from Psalm 5, another from 18, 30, 42, 69, 120, 139. He just strings them all together and keeps on singing because he's happy to be alive. No scholarly evidence for this next part at all, but I wonder if the bad singing is what made the whale throw up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've never had the unique experience of being puked up by a big fish. But I would imagine it would have a profound effect on your life. And so it was for Jonah that afterwards, when the call of God comes again to him, Jonah decides that this time he will acquiesce. 500 miles later, he arrives in Nineveh. 
He spends some time walking around the city, and then the world's worst prophet gives the world's worst and shortest prophetic speech. The entire speech goes like this. In 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. That's all. As someone who has cooked up a great many sermons, this one isn't even half-baked. It's not just that Jonah's not trying. It's an example that this Danny DeVito type Jonah is in all his passive aggressive glory. As if to say, well, God, I did what you told me to do and look, nothing has changed. But wait a minute. When the Ninevites hear this half-baked one-line sermon, everybody from the king on down repents. They cover themselves with dust and ashes and put on really bad clothes. And the king, the king proclaims that not just the people, but that the animals also have to repent and put on sackcloth and ashes. So picture the cows and the sheep and the donkeys all head down low to the ground thinking about their sins. The worst prophetic speech ever. And nevertheless, the Word of God gets through. We begin to see that that's a message for us who make excuses for not speaking up on God's behalf. Do we really believe the Word of God can get through? Even in this imperfect prophet, it does. It's hysterical, the essence of humor, because it is so incongruent. The Old Testament prophets are notoriously unsuccessful. They're brilliant, they're courageous, they're people of strong faith, and they are given the word of the Lord, then they speak truth to power, but then power turns around and ignores them or jails them, or runs them out of town, or maybe tosses them down a well. Except for Jonah, the world's worst prophet. When he speaks, the whole kingdom of enemies listen and they change and then we get to the crux of this story where Jonah admits why he tried to sail away in the opposite direction from God's call he says he was afraid that this would happen he did not want his enemies to receive God's mercy he wanted the revenge he wanted their destruction. Now, most preachers are afraid people will not respond to their message. Jonah is afraid that they will. Jonah knows God is merciful. God is merciful, but Jonah is not. Jonah knows that these people had slaughtered his countrymen, wives, children, torn them from their homeland, and he wants to rain fire down from heaven on them. And when he does not get it, Jonah walks away from God and walks out of the city up onto a hill overlooking the city. And out of some little twigs, he builds a pathetic little hut and he sits down to watch what's going to happen and you can tell he's thinking to himself I'll just wait and see because maybe these Ninevites will repent from their repenting and then God will come along and have to smite them which is to say the great prophet goes up the hill to pout except God sends the hot sun and this sultry hot wind to blow upon Jonah and bake him as if he wasn't already baking with anger enough inside. But overnight, God sends a little plant that grows quickly overnight. There's no biblical evidence for this, but I think it was probably Kudzu that he sent over him to grow up overnight. And Jonah, under the shade of this little plant, gets relief the next day. Now, most, most Bible translations say the plant made Jonah happy. I want to say, no, that doesn't come close to what the Hebrew actually says. The Hebrew says, 
and delighted Jonah upon the plant a great delight. Delighted Jonah upon the plant a great delight. He is so overwhelmed. It feels underneath this plant like heaven on earth, the garden of earthly delights. And then God sends a worm. God sends a worm and kills the plant overnight. And Jonah says again he wants to die because it's not worth living if his plant had died. God says, you care about this plant which grew up in a night? You have compassion on this plant? You care so much you don't want to live? Well, how then do you think I feel about Nineveh's 120,000 people, not to mention all those repentant cows? And that is how the book of Jonah ends with a question about the cows and the people. Book of Jonah ends on this hysterical and yet piercing question. You can read the book of Jonah as satire, irony, derision, wit, humor, but it has a serious purpose there. For all its humor, it assumes that God calls the faithful. But the question is, will the faithful answer the call. Jonah gives the worst sermon in the world, and yet the Ninevites all, to a person, change. Which is to say, the prophetic words of faith, no matter how imperfectly spoken, can have world-changing impact. But will the faithful speak the words? When God calls and expects us to say, here I am, Lord, send me, do we instead get that answer, give that answer, Lord, let let me get back to you on that. Prophetic acts can turn the world around, but do we want that new world that God calls us to? I said earlier, the, the fish is not a whale. It says it's a great fish because that is a word that, that really kind of uh, ties together this whole book. You see, the word repeats, God sends a great wind, a great fish, a, a, a great plant to this great, great city. But a worm is all it takes to take Jonah's faith away. It stirs Jonah's moral conscience, this worm, but the worm eats away at the plant. And you wonder if the worm is a parallel character to Jonah because the worm of wrath, anger, is gnawing at Jonah's insides. The love of hatred in Jonah is more than his love of God. There's a worm gnawing inside Jonah. The worm is hungry for anger and wrath and nostalgia of how things used to be. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament says, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And I think the book of Jonah nails it. Do we fear how much God's love can change the world? Or do we want the world as it is and how we want it? To put it a different way, when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, do we resonate with that as our call from God? When Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Are we willing to stand up for righteousness and justice? When Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, is mercy the kind of stuff that we're nurturing our soul with? And when Jesus says, love your enemies, what do we do with that call? Would we rather sit with Jonah and pout under our dead plant instead of rejoicing in the possibilities of the new life 
that God can give. In the book of Jonah, God really did want the Ninevites to change, and they did. God also wanted Jonah to change. But Jonah was stuck in the past, stuck in his anger, stuck in his nostalgia. So this book of the Bible is there to make us laugh and to make us, in the midst of our laughter, take a hard look at ourselves. What about us? God gives a call. As the hymn we're about to sing says, God calls from tomorrow. But are we stuck in yesterday, nurturing past pains and hurts, resentment and anger? Are we, like Jonah, tempted when God calls to block the call, give the busy signal, just plain throw away the phone? But God is calling to our deepest sense of self, wondering if we are home to answer. For all its humor and irony, it's asking serious questions. And I think above all, when you really look at the book of Jonah, you see it's a book with so much joy. The unbelieving sailors who act like believers, the evil Ninevites who end up being more faithful than the faithful, the animals themselves bowed down in prayer, the big fish who should terrify and devour, but who ends up being an agent of God's salvation. The biggest joke of all is Jonah, the reluctant prophet who loved his wrath more than he loved God and God's love. The book of Jonah asks, are we ready to laugh at ourselves? To laugh at ourselves enough to come to ourselves and see that we can end up stuck in our anger. Jonah's faith can be undone by a worm. Jonah's the worst prophet ever, but arguably he may also be the best prophet ever because he has saved this entire city, not to mention all those repentant cows. The tragedy is Jonah can't see and feel the grace that has been given as he responds to God. Sometimes that happens to us too. There is so much grace that people of faith do by their words and deeds. So many ways that people of faith bless the world with forgiveness and with hope and with transformation and joy. The book of Jonah ends on a question, which is to say the book of Jonah ends up from being a book in the Bible to being a question for our lives. Are we like Jonah, running the other way from God's call, or are we responding? As the wind of God blows, the Spirit of God blows, are we ready to answer and see the love, the new world that is about to take place? That's the question before us. Amen.
Friends, you may be seated. As we prepare our hearts and minds for the prayers of the people, we are reminded that we are a Stephen ministry congregation. That means Stephen ministers are available for prayer in the Melrose Chapel following each of our services for private and confidential prayer. Our deacons each Sunday also provide flowers that you can take with you as you visit someone to remind them of God's love or remind yourself of the same. I also want to extend some gratitude to our wonderful congregation for your generosity in responding to the need of the Code Purple Shelter with our partner, First Presbyterian Church of Pontiac. Uh, We received food, donations, and volunteers to spend time there. That effort continues, and we are again thankful for your generosity and your continued prayers. Friends, please join me in a word of prayer. Lord of mercy and grace, who pursues us relentlessly as you pursued that reluctant prophet of yours, Jonah, we pray as he prayed, that we cry out to you, O Lord, because of our affliction, trusting that you answer us. Out of the depths of shale, we have cried, and you have heard our voice. And so, Lord, help us to trust that even now you hear our words, not because we are eloquent, not because we are great people of prayer, but because your faithfulness is great. By your Holy Spirit, be present to guide us so that our prayers may serve your will and show your loving care for the whole creation. We pray for the nations of the world, O Christ, ruler of rulers, guide the leaders of all the nations that they may learn to seek justice, govern wisely, and serve you as good stewards of the whole creation and for the common good. We pray for peace. O Christ, prince of peace, speak quietly to the hearts of your people and to those who rule in places of power that they may seek peace on earth overcoming the powers of fear, greed, and vanity that turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. May all who claim your name be makers of peace. We pray for health. O Christ, the great healer, you desire health and wholeness for your people. Cleanse and redeem your whole creation that poverty may turn to abundance that streams of living water may flow in the wilderness and those who are broken in body and spirit may find rest and newness of life. We pray for those who mourn. O Christ, who wept at the grave of a friend, look with compassion on all those who mourn as we remember them, celebrate their lives, give thanks for our memories together and look forward in faith to that promised future. That they may find comfort in their sorrow and know the healing power of your assurance that they are never separated from your love. O Christ, you intercede for us at the throne of grace and know our needs better than we can speak or imagine. Receive our prayers despite whatever reluctance in our hearts, that they may be an acceptable offering to Almighty God, whom with you and the Holy Spirit we honor and praise, trust, and love. Amen.
As Paul went out from his congregations, he charged his people to go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the hope given to us by that Holy Spirit, support us and guide us on our journey now and always. Amen.